，谁将锁定胜局？大选后，中美关系会否迎来转机 ？Do you think the trajectory of the America-China relationship is going to have a fundamental change after this election? Either way. 美大选前加强对台军售，新冷战还是真热战 ？When people talk about war between China and the United States, they are talking about mutual suicide. 风云对话专访美国在台协会前任处长、卡内基国际和平研究院杰出学者包道格，美国前驻华大使、伍德罗·威尔逊国际学者中心杰出学者瑞孝杰。Covid, Covid, Covid, Covid. By the way, on November 4th, you won't hear about it anymore. It is going wild, though. It passed a thousand people a day. He looked at the camera. Remember what he said? He said, "It is what it is." If Biden wins, China wins, all these other countries win, we get ripped off by everybody. No, he expects us to learn how to die with it. That's what I told him. He's doing nothing. It's because I was elected to fight for you, and I fight harder than any president has ever fought before. 十一月三日，美国总统大选正式拉开帷幕。据专业机构预测，二零二零美国总统大选投票人数将达一点五亿。投票率创一九零八年以来一百一十二年最高纪录。根据近期的多项民调显示，就全美平均民调而言，拜登占优势。然而，在六个关键摇摆州，两人选情焦灼，拜登仅维持有限的领先。拜登如今的民调领先会转化为选票领先吗？如果真的选票领先了，又会转化为选举人票领先吗？包道格，卡内基国际和平研究院杰出学者，美国知名亚洲问题专家。他曾任里根、老布什政府、国家安全委员会亚太事务主任兼总统特别助理。他还曾在美国国务院政策规划人员部门任职，并担任过中央情报局高级分析专家。当美国大选遇上新冠危机，包道格对选情有着怎样的看法呢？ So, in your view, how or whether is this pandemic going to affect America's presidential election this year? Well, a lot depends on whether we have a second surge of the virus between now and November. President Trump is hoping very much that will not occur, but I think the behavior of people going to beaches and bars and restaurants. May make it possible for those who have not yet been infected to be affected in a second wave, and then the U.S. economy will have to be shut down again, and that could deeply depress voting for the current administration. It may not win support for an alternative from Mr. Biden and the Democrats, but the political effect could be very large. On the other hand, if the virus disappears during the summer, we don't have another wave. Then a lot will depend on how quickly the severely affected parts of our economy can be put back to work, and ordinary workers can get their jobs back. Even there, I think changes that will be brought by this virus are much bigger than we can anticipate now.、Mm. This has been a this has a permanent effect. It's not just temporary. Well, so you mean the impact on the presidential election is still uncertain? Quite uncertain.、It、has multiple variables that could. Push it in one direction or another. There are criticisms saying that President Trump's now trying to play the blame game in order to avert people's attention away from his ineptitude at managing this crisis. Do you agree with this? I think that's absolutely right. I think he had a very strong economy, very low unemployment, and a very high stock market going into the election at the beginning of the year, and he thought he could ride that all the way to the election. All three of those have been profoundly changed, and so he has to find some way telling the American people he had been a very successful president, and that something happened and it's not his fault, and he should not be punished with a loss of his second election、uh, for what's happened. So naturally, he's blaming the virus and blaming China to divert attention from his own. Chaotic behavior. Then, how is this blame game received by the American public? It very much depends on the partisan affiliation of the people. Republicans, 70 percent and more, think、uh, Trump is right about the source of our problems, and about the same percentage of Democrats think he's wrong. It's exposing yet again the very deep political divisions in the American public over many issues, 
the virus is just the latest one. Do you think the trajectory of America-China relationship is going to have a fundamental change after this uh, election? Either way. The general direction is not going to change. People are very unhappy with China for a variety of reasons. Right now, it's a generalized sentiment that started with the business community, but it's extended to the security community and elsewhere. And uh, Hong Kong, Taiwan, Southeast Asia, South China Sea, all these things have added issues to the discussion. We have to disentangle some of that. We have to start showing that we can reduce the edge of, of confrontation place by place, bit by bit. Again, on some issues, our interests will clash fundamentally. We have to manage that. It's entirely possible for us to manage these because the alternative, not managing them, allowing them to go into conflict would be the end of the 21st century. We should not reach the end of the 21st century before we realize that we can save the 21st century. And the question now is whether we will, we will find the right direction and then take it. Uh, we haven't done it yet. It's still out there to be achieved. What would be the key elements to constrain the conflicts between the two countries? It's being frank with each other about our differences and then explaining some things are intolerable, some things are manageable, finding a modus vivendi, a way of getting along in a variety of areas, showing some mutual restraint, respect for the other's authority. The United States in the security confrontation needs to understand that China is going to have a larger voice in Asian Pacific affairs. China needs to understand the United States re retains abiding allies and interests in the region and is not going to abandon the region. Um, that's just in the Asia Pacific. We have to take these issues to other parts of the world and other areas like cyber domain, outer space, maritime frictions, and work them out one by one. But do you think what is happening between China and America really is already a Cold War? Or the starting of a Cold War? I don't think we can have a Cold War any more than we can have deglobalization. The conditions of the Cold War were very separate, you know, total separation, imperial conquest by Russia of Eastern Europe, Central Asian republics, the no real trade, no real exchanges between the two sides. China is much more integrated into the world and into the international institutions that have been fairly successful in the post-war era. China wants to change some of those, and that's a, one of the arguments that people are having to uh, criticize China. Cold War is the wrong term to use, but so many people are using it, we can't avoid it. <laughs> then how would you describe what is happening between China and America? Well, it's intensifying competition and rivalry, and it's... Um, uh, it's, it's more uh, of a competition or more of a rivalry? Well, both are involved. Rivalry and competition are not much different in meaning. The question is, has always been, how do you send messages? If China has red lines, the U.S. should have some red lines too. And not just the U.S., but Japan and other neighbors of China have their right to speak and have their interests respected. And it's negotiating those. That's the job of statespeople or statesmen. Uh, that, and that's the job that's not right now being done. It may be done before a conflict, hopefully not after a conflict. The path is so uncertain right now, I don't know which way it will end up. Mm. Well, some people will say that actually one of the problems that exist between China and America is their lack of uh, mutual understanding. So how would you compare or assess the understanding they hold for each other, I mean, respectively? Well, I think levels of understanding among the a small part of the elites is pretty good, but a very substantial number of people who have been uh, voicing the, their opinions uh, are not that knowledgeable or they're very particular in what they're interested in. You have a, uh, in the U.S. and the community of people who are most familiar with China, we have a real division of generations. The older generation who knew China in the 1970s and 80s have a very a different view of how you can work with a China that's different from the United States than younger people who've, who've focused on the period since the late 90s, early 2000s, who are much more concerned about a China that's aggressive, trying to dismantle the international system that has military territorial ambitions in the Asia Pacific region. And um, th these two world views are quite, uh, quite starkly different.
。回溯中美关系发展的历史轨迹，上一次的重大挫折是在上世纪九十年代初，随着东欧巨变、苏联解体、国际政治格局风云变幻，美国和西方反共反华势力一时甚嚣尘上，中美双方持续对抗。双边关系陷入1979年建交以来的最低谷。那时的美国驻华大使正是今天节目的另一位嘉宾瑞笑简。瑞笑简是美国前职业外交官，职业生涯见证了朝鲜战争、中美建交等重要的历史时刻。1935年生于中国南京，儿时在成都度过，在中国亲历了抗日战争、解放战争和新中国的成立。对于当年和现在的两段关系低潮，他又会如何比较和看待 ？You used to be ambassador to China nearly 30 years ago, and that was sort of a low tide of China-America relationship. But compared to the early 90s, what are the major difficulties in China-America relationship today? That would you say? Situation in China then has some similarities to today. And some very big differences, because China was at the beginning of developing its economy, and now its economy is the second largest in the world, and may surpass the American economy in the near future. So, and China is a much stronger power militarily, and this has become a major problem in the U.S. view of China at the present time, because at the present time, some of our foreign policy specialists. Have taken the view that our policy of engagement with China has failed, but they didn't offer anything to substitute for that. So, if we don't engage with China, then what is our policy going to be? Is it going to be conflict? Is it going to be containment? This is an issue that's very much under debate in the United States at the present time. There seems to be a consensus in Congress among both Republicans and Democrats that we are entering a new era. Of strategic competition with China, and so that seems to be emerging as the basis for the relationship, but translating that into specific policies has not yet been done. We have seen sort of a change in the attitude of the Congress towards China. Would you say this change is abrupt, or there is a logic sense in the timeline all the way? I think it's been a gradual process,、uh, but it has speeded up. In the recent years, what we have seen over the last five to six years, even before President Trump came into office, was that one of the pillars of our relationship with China, which was the positive attitudes of the American business community toward China, were increasingly becoming negative. We felt that China was stealing our intellectual property and forcing our companies to transfer technology to China, and there was a growing Amount of complaints from our business community, and China was not responding in a positive way to that factor. We lost when President、uh, Trump came into office the support of our business community for an improved relationship with China. So you mean、uh, the traditional support for China and Chinese people in the past was now gone?、Uh, it was less than before. I won't say it was gone, because we still have large investments in China. And our business people still would like to take advantage of the opportunities、uh, to have a good, constructive business relationship with China. After all, you're the largest market in the world. But、uh, it's not as strong as it was before, and therefore a lot rests on how our trade agreement. We have an interim trade agreement in January, and、uh, that has helped to stabilize the situation. But we don't know whether that situation will remain stabilized or not. Because we're in the middle of a presidential campaign, some people may worry that a war between America and China might be imminent. Do you share the same concern somehow? No, I spent a lot of time working on the Soviet Union during the Cold War. The Cold War lasted 45 years. The United States and Soviet Union were hostile during much of that time, and it didn't result in war. And the reason was because both sides recognized. That war would be suicidal. Both of us had the ability to destroy the other country with nuclear weapons, and as a result, there was a growing desire on the part of both the Soviet Union and the United States to stabilize the situation so that war would not result. 
At the time, we had proxy wars. We fought the war in Korea, we fought the war in Vietnam, and the Soviet Union was on the other side in those wars. But we didn't get into direct conflict with each other. Well, those types of constraints exist in the US-China relationship as well. In other words, each side has the ability to destroy the other country with nuclear weapons uh, if we were to get into a major conflict. And what we learned during the Cold War with the Soviet Union was, once you start a war, between two nuclear powers, it's very difficult to control escalation. When people talk about war between China and the United States, they are talking about mutual suicide. Mm. And I don't think either of our countries is going to go down that road.近段时间以来，美国在涉台问题上一直小动作不断。自特朗普上任后，已签署多项涉台重要法案，其中就包括《台湾旅行法》。继八月初美国卫生部长阿扎尔访问台湾后，九月十七日，美国副国务卿克拉奇访问台湾，成为自一九七九年美台断交以来访问台湾的美国最高级别现任政府官员。But it seems like, I mean, the atmosphere between America and Taiwan were getting cozier in recent years. From the Taiwan Travel Act to the speculated that Taiwan's joining to the Rain Pact 2020, do you see any danger, though, lying in these activities and motions? Uh, yes, there is danger. Because I probably, uh, as much as any American, understands how sensitive the Taiwan issue is for Beijing. But at the same time, I think members of the Congress are not focused on those dangers. And they see Taiwan as a thriving democracy, which handled the COVID-19 coronavirus problem very successfully. And so it's gained some admiration in the United States. And Tsai Ing-wen, I've met with her on numerous occasions, is a careful person and a very intelligent person. And she understands that the two most important relationships for Taiwan are its relationship with the mainland and the relationship with the United States. And so her intent is to try to keep balance between the two sides of the strait on that question. But how does she do this? Because the domestic forces in Taiwan from within her own party are pressing in the direction of more independence for Taiwan. But at the same time, you can't go down that road without creating a crisis with the mainland. Mm -hmm. And so her basic underlying approach has been to try to maintain the status quo. Well, do you really think that Taiwan or Taiwanese leader at this moment is trying to balance the relationship between America and the relationship with China? Or somehow they are also trying to you know, take advantage of the status quo of the Sino-America relationship? Uh, it's a combination. <laughs> Political leaders have to deal with the real circumstances they face. And the situation in Taiwan is that you have pressures in Taiwan to move in a direction that would be very dangerous. And so wise leaders in Taiwan, and this would include Ma of Taiwan and Tsai, are careful about moving in a dangerous direction. But in the past, the United States has also recognized that it would be dangerous for the United States if a government in Taiwan were to move too far in a direction that was inconsistent with a one China policy. So we have served as a restraint on Taiwan. The problem at present is that this administration is not maintaining those restraints as strongly as earlier administrations did. And so Taiwan has a situation where it has openings to push in a dangerous direction. And that is why the situation is a very sensitive uh, situation. So in my judgment, both sides, or all three sides, if you will, uh, the mainland, Taiwan, the United States, all need to think very carefully about whether we want to permit the situation with respect to Taiwan to change the status quo. 
But do you think President Trump is aware of the sensitivity of this issue? And when the Bill Taiwan Travel Act is passed, how, how do you see this move? Do you see it as a violation of the three joint communique? The language of the Taiwan Travel Act is inconsistent with our commitment to a one China policy uh, within the framework of the three communiques, because it calls for us to send our most senior leaders, uh, both civilian and military to Taiwan. It wants us to be able to have no more restraints on the level of the officials that we will send to Taiwan. But under our three communiques, we are committed to having an unofficial relationship with Taiwan. And so there is an inconsistency between the language of the Taiwan Travel Act and between our policy framework for dealing with the issue. But at the same time, the Taiwan Travel Act was passed what, a year and a half ago, and President Trump has not yet sent senior officials to Taiwan. So that would suggest that he has some understanding of the sensitivity of the issue. And the second factor, which is important, the Taiwan Travel Act is not a binding act. It doesn't force the administration to send more senior people to Taiwan. It merely expresses the hope of Congress that the president will do so. So at the moment, I think President Trump has shown restraint on the issue, but the danger is it's not clear whether or not he is going to maintain that constraint in the face of political pressures from in the United States to move to show more friendship mm. for Taiwan. Well, Technically speaking, I mean, from the legal point of view, the Taiwan Travel Act and the three joint the communique, which one is more official? The three communiques. But the three communiques, don't forget, are statements by each administration. They don't carry on to the next administration. And so the pattern has been, uh, don't forget the three communiques are not, are not signed documents. Because the first communique, the Shanghai communique, occurred when we didn't have diplomatic relations. And China was not willing to sign a document with the United States when we didn't have diplomatic relations. So the pattern is that each time a new administration takes office in the United States, the new president reaffirms mm. that he will be guided by the three communiques and the Taiwan Relations Act. And that's what President Trump has done. So he has committed his administration to abiding by the three communiques, but some of his actions are in inconsistent with that. Wow. And then so, is it a signal that somehow he's going to stop doing so in his next term? My own sense is that the president is conscious of the dangers of moving outside of the framework of the three communiques. And the second positive factor is President Trump attaches particular importance to his relationship with President Xi Jinping of China. And he has shown that through personal conversations with President Xi, President Trump has taken actions which have helped to ease certain strains in the relationship. The way I would sum it up, I think the risks of actions that could destabilize the situation are greater now than they used to be, but that at the same time, there are signs that the president is reluctant to take actions that would destabilize the relationship. 十月二十六日，美国国防安全合作署宣布，将向台湾出售总价约二十三点七亿美元的一百枚鱼叉暗防巡航导弹系统。这是美方不到一周时间内第二次宣布对台军售，也是美国总统特朗普任期内第九次对台军售。九次军售总价值超一百七十四亿美元。金额之巨大，创下了台湾对美军购的记录。与此同时，武器种类不断升级，性能不断增强，正逐渐突破防御性武器的限制。同一天，中国外交部宣布，针对参与早前一批美国对台军售的美国企业以及有关个人和实体实施制裁。中方再次敦促美方恪守一个中国原则的承诺。和中美三个联合公报的规定，停止售台武器和美台任何军事联系。本期节目的嘉宾之一包道格曾出任小布什政府美国在台湾协会处长，对美国近期一系列的涉台动作，他又是怎样解读的呢？ 
how do you think the future relationship between uh, Taiwan and America is going to be? Is it going to get any cozier than it is now? U.S.-Taiwan relations are very good right now, very warm, and part of that will be to expand the aspects of free trade between the U.S. and Taiwan that have been impeded by Taiwan uh, legislation and, and uh, history and practices. And so we'll be pursuing a trade and investment framework agreement. That could be quite substantially closer. Some in the administration would like to have closer military relations. I'm not sure how wise that would be. There's a lot Taiwan needs to do in its military that the U.S. can do without really crossing any red lines, what I think are red lines. So things can get a little warmer, but it's really at a very high uh, quality relationship right now. I guess what I'm saying is it's a matter of degree. I don't think it's going to change fundamentally, but it could be you know, slightly upgraded. You see, State Secretary Pompeo issued a written statement to Taiwanese leader on the day of her inauguration, and this obviously was denounced by the Chinese government. But why do you think Mike Pompeo would choose to do so? He's literally the first State Secretary of America to issue such a letter to Taiwan, I mean, especially after the three joint communique. There seems to be a view uh, among many in the administration that Taiwan will be a very good ally in the coming Cold War struggle with China. They haven't asked Taiwan if Taiwan wants to be an ally in that struggle. And so I think that there may be a different answer than they would expect to get. But for the time being, no Taiwan official is going to reject recognition through letters and statements and videos that are sent to praise them it would be politically impossible for a leader of Taiwan. So we're in a situation now where Pompeo and others in his administration and Trump's administration are kind of pushing the envelope on Taiwan. Mm -hmm. And the question is you know, now, how will China respond and how much will Taiwan go along with some of this? I think the leaders in Taiwan are a little wiser than many in Washington think and won't be playing these games. But this is one area where the chances of an outbreak of violence are still pretty low. But if it does happen, the consequences can be huge. Then uh, how uncertain or dangerous is the Taiwan factor can be in the China-U.S. relationship? The interesting thing about the Trump administration is the people in his administration seem to be more in favor of trying to introduce official aspects of relations with Taiwan than Trump himself is. Trump seems to be either uncaring or very cautious about Taiwan. I think it's a mixture of the two. He never really cared about sort of the small market and it's complicated. And he also, I think, heard very clearly from uh, President Xi Jinping that this is a red line issue for China and he should be very careful about it. And so I think Trump is actually, despite his behavior in most areas, is the cautious party in U.S. policy management toward Taiwan. Then do you think the Trump administration, not Trump himself, is deliberately trying to utilize Taiwan as a leverage to see sort of the bottom line of China or to even provoke China? I think there are people in the administration who would like to use uh, Taiwan as a club to hit China. I don't think Trump, Trump shares that view. So far, the evidence is that he does not share that view. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe he hasn't paid attention to it. Someday he'll wake up and decide it's time to use Taiwan for that purpose. But so far, I think it would be unfair to the Trump administration to claim that they are trying to use Taiwan as a lever against the mainland. And it would be very dangerous for Taiwan as well. I think some, most people in Taiwan, uh, thoughtful people, would think that.